I, I would also also like if possible if you could send maybe I would be able to come. Thank you. Yes, excellent. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to one of more of our impact lecture today. I think that we have two. We have this one, and then we have at 12 CT the artificial intelligence playground that we are going to develop and we are going to present. Elena is going to present an artificial intelligence tool. So my name is Kostas. I'm one of the impactors. Uh, that I like this, you know, I think Samia has introduced, you know, this name. And I would like to welcome um, our colleague from Greece, a very distinguished scientist, and I will, uh, I will explain you why, uh, Professor Damianos um, Gavalas. Damianos is a professor in the University of Aegean uh, in the School of Engineering. Uh, his education, he has received a bachelor degree in informatics from the University of Athens then a master in telecommunication and inform information systems from the University of Essex uh, in UK, and then a PhD in 2001 in electronics engineering from the same university, University of Essex, Essex of UK. His research interest includes, among others, uh, e-tourism, mobile computing, extended reality, wireless networking, and other things that I'm pretty sure that he's going to tell us during his presentation. The title of his presentation today is Immersive Virtual Reality in the Preliminary Phases of the Design Thinking Process, Emphasizing Inclusive Design. And uh, I will say that uh, the floor um, is yours, uh, Damianos, uh, for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. OK, uh, you can hear me, right? Very well. OK, good. Um, uh, thank you, Costa. Thank you for your kind invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to um, to present our work in my university. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, happy to be with you guys today. Um, so, Costa has already mentioned what is the title of uh, yeah, you can you can see the cover page of my presentation. Uh, so, let me let me start. Okay, um, basically the core of my presentation is uh, present, it's, it's a presentation of a um, research project we are running in uh, the University of the Aegean together with other partners uh, around Europe. Uh, it is called VR for All. It is, um, VR for All stands as the acronym of a research project entitled Immersive VR Technologies as a Means to Empathizing Disabled Users in the Design for All Process. Uh, it is actually an Erasmus Plus KA2 uh, project. Uh, it is a collaborative project. The six project partners are universities and companies from Greece, from Portugal, Germany, Czech Republic, and uh, Romania. Um, let me start. Um, as it is usually the case, um, in order to explain better the scope, the concept, and uh, the results of a research project, we we start with a problem, okay? What is the problem that we are dealing with, right? Uh, the problem statement. So, as you may see in the upper right picture, empathizing with users is the first and foundational step in the design thinking methodology. Design thinking is basically, um, it, is, um, it is a very basic term for us. Uh, it is a methodology, a standard methodology that we uh, pursue uh, whenever we have to design anything, let it be product, service or digital application or anything. So what I mean is that empathizing with users uh, is the first thing we need to do whenever we start a new design project. By the term empathy, uh, we refer to the ability to share, understand and acknowledge what the users perceive and experience. Now, uh, in the design thinking process, the empathize phase aims at uh, gaining insight into the users. Uh, that is, the people will actually be using the end product, the end system, or the end service. We need to understand their needs, their constraints, and uh, their motivations. In uh, general, empathy enables designers to see with the eyes of another, uh, putting aside their own perceived assumptions and understanding the experience of the, the target users. Um, the empathize methods includes um, several. There are several actually methods like experts consultation, uh, 
uh, qualitative and quantitative user research methods such as questionnaires and uh, interviews and so on, uh, photo and video user-based studies, uh, field observation, uh, the so-called of uh, the so-called empathy maps, uh, etc. Uh, but the most effective way for a designer uh, to gain empathy comes in the form of the so-called immersion. What is immersion? Immersion is the direct experience of the lives, the context, and the environments and activities of the target audience in order to experience firsthand what it feels like uh, to be the end user. Now, a crucial requirement for any design project, uh, either for physical or digital products, uh, is to make the product accessible, usable, and inclusive. Design for all stands an umbrella term. It is also known as universal design or inclusive design. These are synonyms. Uh, and refers to the design of products or environments to make them accessible to all people, regardless of age, regardless of disability, or any other factor. Uh, the problem is that empathizing, empathizing with users becomes more challenging from professional designers involved in the design of products or systems to be used by seniors or individuals with disabilities. And why is that? because designers often lack lived experience, which would allow them to easily empathize with those target groups. I mean that it is really difficult to really feel how it is to be blind because you have never been blind, right? So it's difficult to imagine how it is, what kind of challenges blind people uh, meet in their everyday lives. So what can we do about it? Um, what can we do to make designers really feel what it is like to be a disabled person? To this end, uh, there are some interesting visual impairment simulators like those glasses with special lenses, uh, which uh, change your perspective and may simulate, for instance, the loss of central vision in this one or peripheral vision with this one. Or there are some digital tools like this one that make it possible to a designer to realize how it is to have loss of central loss of central vision or to have glaucoma uh, when using a mobile or web application. Those are nice tools, uh, but the problem with them is that, that you have firstly to fully implement and prototype your end product. And then in the end, test it and see how it is like from a disabled person point of view. But then it is already too late, isn't it? I mean, because of your, because if your prototype product is not inclusive enough, is not accessible enough, then you have to go back to the early design phases, make different design decisions and prototype and test your product again. So the question is, how can we avoid this trouble? Can we make better and more informed decisions earlier. So we came up with a better idea, um, VR for All idea, where the key idea of a VR for All project is centered around the use of virtual reality in the design for all project, uh, process. Why VR? Because in the end of the day, VR is all about simulation. Uh, virtual reality represents an effective tool for a simulating experience which can be similar to those of the real world. Immersive VR may be viewed as an empathy tool and allows to feel for a moment what it is like to walk for a while in someone else's shoes. Coming to disabilities, disability simulations can be implemented as virtual environments featuring an avatar that the user can embody. Uh, the avatar can feature certain disabilities that complicate interaction with the immediate environment. That way, we expect that participants without disabilities are put in the situations designed to briefly mirror the lives of those with disabilities as realistically as possible. Interestingly enough, uh, recent studies have shown that users elicit greater empathy for the disabled if they have previously embodied an avatar with a disability in VR. And the most important remark, 
the use of VR simulations as a means to empathy users in the design process has not been investigated so far, particularly in the context of design for all. So this is actually where our project comes, comes in. Um, to be honest with you, uh, truth is uh, that uh, this is not the first time that someone tries to utilize VR as a tool to cultivate empathy. Uh, so here are some ways that um, VR has been used so far in that respect. First of all, simulation of different um, perspectives. Uh, virtual reality can place users in the shoes of someone else, allowing them to experience life from a different perspective. For example, uh, to simulate the daily challenges met by people with disabilities, helping users understand the physical and social barriers they deal with. Second is social justice. Um, VR experiences can be designed to address social justice issues such as racial inequality, gender discrimination, or even a refugee crisis. Uh, by immersing users in these scenarios, VR can evoke a stronger emotional response and that way to promote empathy. Um, role reversal. Um, VR can enable users to switch roles with others, uh, allowing them to experience life from a perspective of someone they may not typically empathize with. For example, to be a woman if you are a man, or to be a gay if you're straight. Um, last, environmental awareness. VR can simulate the impact of environmental issues such as deforestation or climate change, uh, providing users with first-hand experiences of the consequences of those uh, disasters. Uh, this can enhance empathy for the planet and inspire a sense of environmental uh, responsibility. Coming to the objectives of our project, the, uh, the, the general objective of VR for All is to introduce the use of immersive VR in the preliminary phases of the design thinking process, emphasizing on um, what I described as inclusive design. Uh, the project uh, will deliver virtual environments to enable design designers, uh, basically university students and professionals, uh, to have a first-person perspective of the needs and restrictions of disabled people and to make sure that uh, this way, uh, the end products that those guys will design uh, will be accessible. This objective will be addressed through simulating a variety of disabilities uh, or disorders like visual impairments, um, colorblindness, uh, long or short sightedness, uh, visual field loss, glaucoma, uh, cataract, and so on, and also motor impairments. Uh, so to simulate how it is like to be a wheelchair user, uh, to have lost uh, or damaged upper limbs, to uh, be a Parkinson disease um, uh, patient, and so on. Uh, this is just an illustration for you guys uh, to, to, uh, to perceive the effect of some disabilities. Uh, so this is how it is like to have a normal vision versus to be colorblind. And uh, this is uh, how, to, how it is to be to have a glaucoma in various stages of this uh, disease from the starting point to the end point, or to be a wheelchair user, or to have missing fingers or even missing limbs, and over the here to, uh, to have a hand tremor, to have a Parkinson disease. Okay, let me now briefly explain what is uh, the, uh, the, the research methodology we follow in our project in order to, in order to pursue our objectives. Firstly, what we do is to accurately document and specify the requirements for typical simulated disabilities. Essentially, what we do is that we document how specific disabilities affect people's lives. Um, what are the most uh, common challenges those people face in their everyday activities? And what are the best practices used to satisfy the needs of those people? For instance, how to pursue the interior design of an office if this office is to be accessible by wheelchair users? Then uh, we program a number of VR assets, as we call them, um, or disability filters. Uh, may, it, this might be a term which describes it better. Basically, uh, those are Unity 3D um, software components, which may be used as plugins in uh, VR applications in order to enable the realistic simulation of the disabled people perspective. 
Uh, for instance, you can enable a disability filter uh, to be uh, a wheelchair user, or you can use a camera filter to simulate the perspective of glaucoma patients or people with color vision deficiency. I'm going to uh, show you in the end of the presentation a couple of demonstrations to see how it is like. Um, after that, we define a number of use cases for uh, simulated scenarios. Uh, what's, what, what is a use case? Um, first, um, we define a number of 3D environments uh, where the users will be immersed in. And then we script a number of scenarios for tasks assigned to users in those 3D environments. An example, uh, the, the 3D environment could be a school classroom, okay, with desks and chairs and boards. Uh, and um, that the, any student or the teacher can uh, write something, uh, we're using it to, uh, she can use the marker in order to write something on the board. Now, the use case uh, could be to task a user to act as a student in this classroom, then <coughs> enable the disability filter of a wheelchair to make uh, her avatar behave like a real wheelchair user, and then ask the guy to approach the board and write something on using the marker. And suddenly she might realize that it is difficult to be a wheelchair and uh, use uh, this uh, uh, board or this marker. Having done that, in the end, we proceed to preparing the integrated VR applications, namely the applications that incorporate the 3D models and the disability filters and may be executed on the end user devices. Let them be desktops or even um, uh, VR headsets. Having finalized the technical part, uh, we proceed to the field trials, the pilots, to see whether in the end of the day, our VR tools, uh, they, they can do the job. They can really make a difference in designing better, that means more accessible products. So what is the process here? First, we recruit a fair number of product design students and design professionals. Um, we aim at um, at least 50 and 20 people respectively. And then we separate those people in three different groups. Uh, the first is a control group. And we invite the control group members uh, in a traditional university classroom, and we provide them traditional training. That is uh, a PowerPoint presentation uh, on design for all principles. So for instance, we present to them about the various disabilities, and we show to them pictures illustrating the perspective of the, of the disabled person. The second group, uh, it is an experimental group uh, that uses our VR tool in desktop environment. Those people are invited to actively to, to activate the disability filters one by one, and then carry out specific tasks like the classroom activity I described before. And the third experimental group uh, will use our VR tool in immersive environment. That is, they will go through um, exactly the same process as the second group, but this time they will wear a VR headset to immerse themselves in uh, the 3D world. After the training session, we ask all users, no matter which group they belong to, uh, to go through a design problem. For instance, we could give to them the exact interior design of a school classroom and ask them to make appropriate modifications in this design to make it more accessible. In the end, we ask, um, sorry, we ask um, accessibility experts to assess the handouts, the design proposals of uh, the people, uh, of the participants, and assess to what extent the proposals satisfy uh, the accessibility requirements. As, uh, as you may imagine, uh, our hypothesis and basically our hope is that people that uh, use our VR tool, uh, they will do better uh, than the people of the control group. Uh, namely, they will, uh, in the end, they will design more accessible products. Of course, this hypothesis is to be validated. Uh, we haven't done that uh, yet. So what programs, uh, what progress have we made so far? Um, well, um, right now we are by the end of the first year of the projects. Uh, we have still 18 months ago. Uh, so we have progressed a lot on our technical, on the technical side. 
Um, first of all, uh, VR disability filters are done, uh, colorblindness, glaucoma, wheelchair, missing upper uh, limb and hand tremor, they are all done. Um, we have designed a few uh, 3D walls, which are not yet finalized, but they are almost there. Um, a supermarket environment and a virtual kitchen. Um, we have documented 10 use cases over four different virtual environments. Let me give you an example, a couple of examples. A first um, uh, one use case uh, will be uh, to task to ask the user to enter the virtual supermarket, enable the color blindness filter, and read the ingredients in a package of biscuits, for example. Or a second use case would be to ask the user to enter the virtual kitchen environment, enable the missing limb filter, open the fridge, pick up the milk, open the lid, and pour some um, in a bowl. Please bear in mind that uh, the three worlds, the three D worlds, are designed in such a way um, in order to include several design mistakes. Uh, I mean, in in purpose, we have done some design mistakes with respect to accessibility. For instance, the color of letters in the biscuits box are not appropriately chosen to be readable by people with color blindness. So as soon as you activate your color blindness filter, you'll realize that this is not readable anymore. Uh, likewise, uh, the corridors of the supermarket are somewhat narrow to make it difficult for a wheelchair user to maneuver. Of course, the user, the designer, um, will not realize the issue with uh, the narrow ways before she enables a wheelchair disability filter and experience uh, the problem uh, firsthand. Now, uh, we arrive at the end of the presentation. I have prepared a couple of um, uh, demos for you guys. So let me start the first one. This is uh, the, the supermarket environment. Uh, it's not ready yet. Uh, we haven't put uh, the products on the cells, but we have the layout and we have uh, uh, the cells. Uh, and um, we only um, have to put the textures um, on, on the environment, on the cells and the walls. And uh, of course, to populate the cells with uh, products which are under development right now. So have a look now. So you, you enter the environment and uh, using your uh, control, uh, you can activate one of those disability filters, right? So the user starts and she activates the glaucoma filter. Have a look on that. So you activate the glaucoma, you select it, and as you as you may see easily, you instantly lose your peripheral vision. So this simulates somehow how it is like to be really a glaucoma patient. And in this case, you might not be able to see some labels which are on the top or on the right or left, okay? So that might drive you to redesign somehow the environment in order to be accessible for glaucoma users. So we go on. Uh, we have various products in there, and you can see that uh, most of them are interactive in the sense that you can pick up. You can bring it. Ah, sorry. Maybe you missed that. He just activated. Uh, let me go back a couple of seconds. He activated uh, the colorblindness filter. And now you see the perspective of a colorblind person. You cannot see the red color anymore. And it might be difficult for you to read some letters if the background is wrong. Wheelchair, and then you look beneath and you have lost your uh, legs and uh, you see yourself sitting on a wheelchair. You can drive it, it's, it's an electric one. Uh, so you can maneuver. You might realize that some products are difficult to, to reach if they are on very uh, high solves. You can see that the aisle over here is not wide enough. It's quite narrow. So it's not easy to maneuver in there. So you might think of widening that. So you can, you can see that you can have a, you have a kind of smooth movement 
which is a very good realist, uh, very good uh, realistic simulation of a real wheelchair. We have checked that with accessibility experts. So you see all these kind of challenges made by people. Uh, you cannot have a, um, you know, a shopping cart. It's not easy to drive a shopping cart at the same time that you drive your wheelchair. So some other kind of basket is needed for these people. Okay, that was the first one. And the second one, it's very elementary so far. It's going to be really terrific when it's finished. Um, it is a kitchen. We have a bench. So we have finished with all interactions. So you see that gravity low works with this saucepan. You can pick up a knife. You can slice a lemon. So you see it's quite realistic. Uh, you can put some pepper or salt on your food. You can lift this tray, but if you're not careful enough, the glasses will fall. Some of those interactions were very difficult actually to program. And then you can activate your missing link. So you realize that you don't have two hands anymore, but only one. So in this case, did, did you notice? Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back. Sorry. So again, you have the, now you have Parkinson. So you see you have hand tremor and some of the products might be difficult actually to, uh, to use. It's difficult to cut a lemon now, having a Parkinson's disease, or even pour some salt or pepper. Uh, so you might ask yourself right now, what can you do? Uh, believe me, uh, our design students will have brilliant ideas on how to tackle those issues, okay? So for instance, if you, if you have a saucepan which need two, two hands in order to lift it, uh, they can come with brilliant ideas on what can you do for the case that someone has only one limb and the other one missing. So they can redesign the saucepan so that you can, so that you can lift it with one hand. And, and uh, they will have all these ideas and uh, we expect that by immersing themselves in these kind of environments and meeting the challenges met by those people in, every, in their everyday lives, they will come up in the end with better design ideas, more accessible products. And this is actually what um, our um, project is all about. Okay, that was not long. I hope it wasn't tiring. I hope it was somewhat interesting for you. Thank you so much for being here today and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Samyanos. Uh, it was very, I would say, inspiring for people that we are not from the same topic. And I have some questions on this and uh, some questions more, how we can expand this to, you know, um, higher education, you know, regarding students, not only from the perspective of special needs, but I will provide first the floor to the audience. So if you please stop sharing the screen and I, will ask, I would like to ask uh, the participants if you have any questions or if I can start my questions uh, to Damianos. So, I mean, you can raise your virtual hand if you have questions. I will start then. And I would like to ask you, Damianos, first of all, thank you. This, I think that this is the next uh, era of inclusive, indeed inclusive um, higher education, not only you know, as I said to you about, you know, people with special needs, but also you can load other scenarios. And as you said at the end, to include students to propose themselves their scenarios, 
in order also to be more student-centered, you know, approaches. So my first question is going to be very, I would say, of you know, very si simple. What is the cost of the per oh, to package such facilities apart of the need of some people that they should know how to how to program uh, these environments that you show to us? What is the cost, the minimum cost, in order to introduce to your classroom or to introduce a PhD student? Uh, to start working towards this uh, immersive uh, environments, uh, I mean, do you have an estimate? You know, uh, are we talking about facilities? You like, you mean you mean a student who um, who will be enrolled like a, in programming for such applications? Yeah, let's say that we have the student that knows how to program. I mean, the facility. What kind of facilities do you need? What kind of instruction? Okay. Um, first of all, um, uh, ninety nine percent of developers uh, use the Unity three D uh, software environment. It's basically a game engine, Unity three D. Uh, everybody uses that, and uh, this is uh, Unity. You need to have a license uh, for that. Of course, in the academic environment, you can have like, an academic license, which is much cheaper. So we start with that. Um, then, uh, whatever application you make, uh, you can test it yourself on your desktop. So no extra facility needed so far. But if you need to experience uh, the application from uh, an immersive user point of view, in that case, you need to have the headset, you know, the VR headset. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Oculus headsets, which are um, on the market right now, they cost around uh, six to seven hundred uh, euros user per item. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, the, the basic equipment, a VR headset, uh, which is not uh, connected on on uh, VR, but it's a standalone. Uh, you upload the application on on the headset. Headset is basically a computer. Okay, uh, you upload the application on there, and uh, then uh, you can use it in any in any place, anytime. At your home, for instance. So this is a standard equipment, uh, the VR headset. Uh, no extra facilities required. Excellent. And um, I, my second question on this is like, uh, uh, how can uh, this immersive uh, kind of environments, the virtual reality, can contribute to a more student-centered uh, um, um, education? I, I would like to give you an example. You you gave some examples uh, about special needs, but what about students with learning difficulties? Um, how easy to is to make such a scenarios? I mean, uh, are there any thoughts about this? Well, um, one of the um, uh, the basic arguments for VR is that it, it is inherently more inclusive. Uh, so for instance, um, if I'm a disabled person, uh, I cannot walk to a trail on a mountain, unfortunately, uh, but wearing my VR headset, I can do that. If I'm not a rich person, I cannot go to Peru or Bolivia, but wearing my headset, I can do. Okay, so this is inherently more, more inclusive. Um, unfortunately, as you may easily realize, uh, it excludes people who are blind. Because whenever you wear your headset, actually you lose contact with your environment, but you have to have a uh, vision in order to see that, okay? So uh, if you're blind or visually impaired, unfortunately, uh, we cannot do much with uh, um, virtual, uh, virtual reality. Now, coming back to education, uh, there are different uh, means and different ways actually to uh, effectively utilize VR in education. And in most of the cases, uh, people propose, educators propose, and the researchers propose uh, that uh, you can use VR uh, offline, out of class. So you can assign people with tasks uh, that they can undertake at any place, any time, for instance, at their home. Uh, so you, you, can, you can have a repository of applications, and you can ask, actually, your students to upload your their applications in their desktops or their um, headsets, VR headsets, and uh, have a look on them while being at home as a side exercise, as a side assignment uh, to, to your class. Another direction 
Actually, you have a very interesting talk by Vlas Kasapakis tomorrow, another webinar. And mm -hmm. uh, Vlas is, uh, I'm not sure he's, he's here with us today. Um, Vlas is, uh, he will uh, explain how you, can use, how you can use, hi Vlas. Uh, so Vlas is tomorrow yes, to explain how you can use effectively VVR in synchronous education. Exactly. You have a real, no real, real virtual classroom uh, to have a synchronous education. He will explain how you, the teacher and the students can be together in the same virtual environment and uh, perform some exercise and have some have assignments over there. And imagine the student and the teachers do not have to coincide on the same physical space. The teacher can be in his office and the students can be in the room, okay, in the, at their home. So there are different ways actually to use uh, uh, VR, but as I said in uh, in the beginning, um, VR is supposed to be inclusive uh, by itself. It is inherently inclusive. Yeah, excellent. And I totally agree with you, Damianos, uh, because uh, I was thinking that, you know, VR, you mentioned asynchronous, but I was thinking about synchronous because I think VR somehow uh, shortens the um, transactional distance between teachers and students, because you are pre creating this environment that makes the online education more interactive because people are doing things and um, sure. having, let's say, an illusion. It's not an illusion because it's a virtual reality. Like, like you know, to, to collaborate and, co and, and, um, and act like, you know, they are in the active class. I think um, this is something that, you know, this Moore paper about transactional distance uh, has some criteria, and I think the virtual reality very nice address them. Davida, you would like to say yeah, something? Yeah, this is true. It, it, is, it, it, breaks, it breaks the physical borders, okay? Exactly. The distant borders. And second, you can do things that you cannot do in physical environments. So, uh, Vlas, again, I'm referring to him uh, tomorrow. Let's, keep, let, let's you... keep for tomorrow. For tomorrow. Don't say anything yeah. until tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Davida, Davida is a colleague yes, from uh, Israel, from from Gordon. Gordon College, that they are specialized in education, Daviane. That's it. And uh, you were uh, talking about teacher and student being the same interface, like in the same virtual world, etc. We are using uh, Class VR, which is a kind of uh, app a VR application. But uh, I see a lot of technological barrier uh, from the, the, the cost, if I have to build those scenarios, because what I'm using now is a scenario which are prepared by the uh, content supplier. Uh, in like general uh, uh, um, subject learning and to create such an environment as you described would, uh, uh, would demand the uh, uh, programmers and uh, uh, special equipment, etc., etc., which I cannot see, you know, education is a very poor domain. We don't have a lot of, sub the budget is very uh, small. So how can you see that uh, coming into education? Thank you. It, it is absolutely true what you said. Uh, we still need the, we still lack good applications. Uh, we still uh, lack uh, good uh, 3D worlds. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that uh, if we, uh, you know, if for instance uh, I create a very nice chemistry lab or a very nice physics lab, and um, I I upload it uh, to a central repository. Uh, then it can, it might be instantly useful for you. But it is true. Uh, if you need some custom application for a custom project, then you have to have uh, the, the team to create those words. So the two demos uh, I presented earlier, uh, they have been purposely designed for a, for a specific cause, for a specific, specific project. This is true. Uh, but again, it's true that uh, we still we still lack uh, you know open open uh, walls and open repositories for everybody to benefit from them. Excellent. I will say that this is also a big opportunity. Whatever we are missing, this is the opportunity to act. Uh, I will give the floor to my colleague, um, Professor Abdelilah Kadili from Morocco, from Tankine Foundation. Abdelilah. Thank you. Just a, a piece of information. We have an IDC here. It does. It did cost a lot of money at the, um, the University of Mohammed VI, Mohammed VI Polytechnic in Ben Greer. Uh, it's been spread all over the country. It's a project that's been funded 
buy USAID, a lot of money into it. I did I did the experiences my myself. We have some some um, uh, let's say um, facilities in Rabat, Tangier, and elsewhere. A um, uh, lot of people do talk about a series that explains in in some let's say very accessible uh, terms the good doctor. It does explain. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with that, Doctor Gavalas. It does explain how how it's approached, and they did um, uh, demystify. Uh, VR uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, we've been using it here, we've been explaining that, and we are getting into it um, in a partnership with IDC, Interactive Digital Center in Ben -Gri. Thank you very much, Abdelilah, for the Thank comment. You. I would like to give the floor to our colleague from Vilnius Tech, Ingrita. I cannot pronounce the rest of it. <laughs> <Let's Ingrita. laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I just uh, thought that it is a great idea about using those filters uh, with ER for, uh, to understand uh, the usability and accessibility issues. And uh, what I just want to suggest, uh, since I am also the um, human computer interaction lecturer in my university, I totally believe that such an application would be a perfect integration for all the human interaction courses, because uh, uh, we all talk about uh, the, uh, uh, how different are people, how different uh, uh, they see, how different uh, uh, they behave, but actually we don't have a possibility to feel it until we we don't uh, um, immerse into uh, another person's bodies. So I think this is a, an amazing opportunity if such an application would be shared uh, to, to integrate them into the lectures and, for example, uh, to uh, give people opportunity, to students opportunity to, to feel how the glaucoma people sees everything and that's all. And also I think that it might be also a good addition to computer game uh, industry because also computer games and simulations are everywhere now, and more and more uh, we are immersed in that. And I totally believe that also we don't, now we don't talk man, uh, much about the integration of disabilities and how computer games are adapted to disabilities. And I believe this is the best why it might be a good, uh, a good start to, to talk about that and uh, maybe to test it, uh, how, compu how computer uh, players, computer game players feel that have different disabilities about uh, such a games and what we need to do to make the computer games better for them. So this is my ideas from my perspective and thank you very much. And if, you, if in the future you would like to share it, we will use it very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Ingrida, what I was thinking before I give the floor to Ellie, uh, it's like um, Damianos, probably since we are, you know, a lot of universities here and you mentioned during your talk that you would like students to develop solutions of the problems. Let's, you know, uh, start a hackathon of our students and announce this and use our community in order to offer you the solutions that you are looking for. Mm -hmm. This is something that, you know, please uh, use us, not only use us, leverage us <laughs> in order, you know, to start and it's going to be as Ignita mentioned, an excellent tool and an excellent activity that the, the, young, the young minds, they will love to offer solutions. Uh, I will give the floor to Ellie. And uh, something yeah. else before to Ellie. Ingrida, you mentioned some nice ideas. Probably you should be the next lecturer or the next speaker in this okay. series of talks about AI. I'm keeping this now. Eh? So I'm waiting your proposals. What kind of short lecture you can provide in this series of seminars? Uh, Ellie, the floor is yours. Ellie is the head of Meital, which is like the digital, let's say, center of all the Israeli universities. Yeah, and the Inter University Center for e-learning, and um, and we are um, uh, talking about uh, VR for a long time here in Israel and all of, all over the world. And and there is um, uh, you know uh, two opinion about it. One, it's uh, something that it's uh, very unique and, and important for the pedagogical aspect, and the other question or the other. Uh, ideas that come that it's it's not it's too complicated to implement that in the higher education institute and we heard some questions related to that and we're talking about it for a long time more than five years how to integrate what do you think about it this is uh, something that we will um, uh, be able to integrate in the higher education or it's something that um, it's too complicated for the long term to integrate it in the higher education because of the cost, because of the um, um, 
complicated complicated issue and complicated content that the, or or uh, the the um, challenge to create the content. Very good question, and a very difficult question. Um, in uh, in my opinion, VR is not a panacea. Okay, it's not a solution for everything. Uh, this is definite. Uh, well, everything you said is is true. Uh, there are cost barriers uh, because if you are if you expect your students to have immersive exp immersive experience, yeah, they have you have to to provide them with a, um, a simple um, VR headset, but this is uh, quite still quite expensive. Uh, and uh, as you said, there is all this complication that which is. Um, 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 it is it is an issue. So, for instance, I I believe it is not a good idea to use uh, VR on 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 every lecture. Uh, it's not easy to break the experience of a lecture and ask people to move elsewhere to to wear to wear a headset and uh, move to to another fantastic virtual world. Uh, but in some cases, it can really be useful. And what are those cases? Those cases are um, cases of uh, virtual environments and virtual worlds that you cannot easily have on the physical setting. Uh, for instance, to have, as I said before, a chemistry lab in, in a school that you don't have a real chemistry lab, to have a physics lab, uh, to have a walk on the moon, uh, to, have, to have a walk, to have a field trip, on archaeological sites with your archaeology students, which is not easy to make in reality. Okay, you can be an archaeological archaeological uh, archaeology instructor in a U.S. university uh, and uh, move to Jerusalem, move to Athens, move to ancient Rome. Not not contemporary Rome, even the ancient Rome. So these are things that you cannot easily have in reality. You cannot. Uh, expect people to empathize how ancient Rome was like and how uh, the living in there was like. So uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, there are good examples and not good examples. Uh, as I said before, it's not a panacea. Uh, these are things that you can uh, use in moderation. Okay, uh, it's it's not a solution for every case and for every illness. Okay. But uh, we, we see and uh, we believe that there are some um, good uh, practices and uh, good applications of VR uh, in uh, application, both offline and synchronous. And uh, as I said before, uh, be with us tomorrow. Uh, Vlasis will explain some very good cases of uh, using VR in synchronous education. Thank you, Damianos, and Eli, and all of you for your questions. I think Vlasis Kasapakis talk tomorrow is very much uh, we're looking forward, you know, to what to to follow it. Uh, I would like at this point to thank you. Uh, we managed to have Damianos for an hour instead of twenty minutes. This is very good. Thanks to your questions and uh, thanks to Damianos' presentation. And uh, don't forget that uh, for the impactors that our program continues today at twelve o'clock CET. We have the artificial intelligence playground with another artificial tool that we are going to present. Damianos, I will send you the link. Your students, yourself, you know, these are things that we are, happens every every week. Uh, Samia, probably you can send the link uh, um, in the chat. And tomorrow we are going, of course, to have Damianos. Probably Damianos, you can say us the title, only the title, what are you going to present tomorrow? And also we have in the afternoon at uh, two o'clock, all the LMS technologies that they are available, learning management systems, moderated by Eli uh, at two o'clock CT. Emails they will come in order to inform you. The, Vlasis, the last words is to you to tell us what uh, are you going to present, you... or to Elena what is going to present in an hour. <laughs> Let's start can, with Vlasis. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay. So as you already mentioned, my name is Vlasis Kasapakis. I'm an assistant professor at uh, the Department of Culture, Technology, and Communication, which is actually. In another live island, uh, it's, it's based on another island of the University of, uh, of the Aegean. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to talk about the realization of virtual reality learning environments. I'm going to start with an introduction uh, for uh, virtual reality and what virtual reality learning environments are. 
And we're going to go through uh, some things that Damian also mentioned. We're going to talk about the development and the challenges in the development and the design of virtual reality learning environments and how we can use synchronous communication in virtual reality and how the platforms of synchronous communication provide different affordances for creating exciting and uh, efficient um, educational activities in virtual reality. Thank you very much, uh, Vlasis. Both of you, Damianos and Vlasis, now you're considered impactors, as Samia mentioned. We're going to include in our activities. And uh, Elena, I think Elena is, is with us. Like in an hour, she's going to present a, a tool. Can you please very fast? Uh, yes, yes, I can. I can do it fast. I'm. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to uh, show you um, an AI video editing uh, tool that is interesting, in my opinion. We will discuss the pedagogical applications of the tool, and the, the technical side is just you know AI magic. So I will present the magic, and then we will discuss how we can use it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And finally, Ellie, very fast. What are you going to present tomorrow in the workshop about together with my friend Abdeli Lach and the others, but Eli is the moderator. Mm -hmm. uh, Eli? Yeah, uh, we will present tomorrow the LMS, uh, um, different LMS from three countries. Uh, we understand that LMS, the learning management system, it's become very critical and uh, significant um, uh, tools in the uh, higher education institute. That means it's become the most important or one of the important uh, system that the uh, students uh, use in the higher education. And we will see three different LMS with different aspect or different aspect or different way of using, mostly the pedagogical, pedagogical aspect that uh, uh, will be from, will, will present from Morocco, Italy and Israel. Uh, so it will be interesting to see the difference and to see the, um, uh, the common things between them and to share knowledge and discuss it in the end of the session. Excellent. So I would like to thank you. Thank you also for the ideas. I received two ideas and I will try to organize two round tables, the future of research, as Abdeli Lach has introduced. And, you know, thanks to Damiano's discussion that we had before, I think that I should uh, initiate a round table, the future of higher education. Uh, so thank you very much. We will see again in an hour, less than an hour. Uh, yeah, I posted with, the uh, link, uh, Costas, in the chat. Excellent. Whoever excellent. is interested. Excellent. Thank you very much again for your contribution and participation. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.